A trek through America's Rocky Mountains offers an unbroken series of awe-inspiring perspectives on time and scale. I'm Bill Boggs in the historic Rockies, where the geology of this rugged country tells its story. On the slopes of western Colorado, dinosaur bones trapped for millions of years can be found wearing to the surface. Not far away, the homes of the first human inhabitants are sheltered in sandstone caves. And crisscrossing the whole region are the railway lines of the early pioneers who came to dig rare minerals from the ground. All of Earth's history can be found at your feet. The Rocky Mountains, a place worth exploring for every historic traveler. Our journey across a quarter billion years of Earth's history begins in the fossil fields of Grand Junction, Colorado. From there, we advance a few eons to the ancient Indian village at Mesa Verde, and we'll finish our tour with a ride on the narrow gauge railroad to the mining town of Silverton, Colorado. To the casual visitor, Grand Junction looks like a more scenic version of an average Colorado farm town. But beneath the picturesque vistas lie ages of dramatic upheaval. Once upon a time, this charming valley on the edge of Colorado's western slope was part of a mountain range as high as the Himalayas formed when two plates of the Earth's crust collided. Then millions of years of wind and water eroded this landscape into its present dramatic shape and in the process buried, fossilized, and then expose the bones of Earth's first rulers, the dinosaurs. Some of the world's most important dinosaur discoveries have been made in this valley. Now dino hunters from all over the world, both professional and amateur, come here for the chance to make finds of their own. The Dynamation International Society in nearby Fruta offers a variety of programs to satisfy anybody's dinomania. The most accessible and exciting place to begin your tour of dinosaur country is the Society's Devil's Canyon Science and Learning Center. The center offers more than a half acre of fascinating displays, laboratories, and program space. This quake table gives visitors a chance to find out just what it's like to experience a 5.6 earthquake. But the big attraction, especially for kids, are the lifelike growling, tail-wagging dinosaurs that also spit that give the Dynamation Society its name. The Society's head paleontologist is Dr. Jim Kirkland. He's built an international reputation that includes his discovery of a new dinosaur species called Utah Raptor. Yeah, this is the Utah Raptor. You might know the Velociraptor from the movie Jurassic Park. That's its smaller cousin. Now this is the largest of all the raptors, a 20 foot long, 7 to 8 foot tall, and about 1,000 pounds in body weight. Now we've got a number of bones from the animal, but this is the bone that excites most people. And this is the bone from the hind claw, the killing claw of the Utah raptor. And take a look at that, but then picture putting the horny sheath over it. You know, this is what it would be like in life, sharp enough to shave with. Now this thing could kick this out and kicks, it would slice an animal open, five and six foot long slices, 10 inches deep, every time it kicked. So he would attack a much larger dinosaur, and in a few kicks, he would open the animal like an accordion. Certainly not a dinosaur to mess around with. Yeah. Nearby are two other animated models representing dinosaurs found commonly in the area. The spiny back Stegosaurus, which is Colorado State Fossil, and this fearsome looking Allosaurus, He's not related to the legendary Tyrannosaurus rex who came 80 million years later, but this big meat eater was the number one predator of the late Jurassic period. One of Kirkland's main jobs involves leading serious enthusiasts on a dinosaur hike along what's called the Trail Through Time. And what we're looking at here is the bent leg of a big sauropod, uh, very likely a patasaurus. The one I grew up learning is brontosaurus, the thunder lizard, but certainly more properly called a patasaurus. Now what we're seeing here is the thigh bone. This is your thigh bone. Right down there where it bends is where it would hook into the hips. And right in here, it's kind of been eroded away, is the knee area. You can see this is a pretty big animal. 
and it probably weighed about 20 tons, and these rocks are dated about 150 million years ago. So this is probably the largest dinosaur we're going to see on this hike today. In fact, they're in the land of the giant dinosaurs. We have several kinds that probably reached over 100 feet long that are known from the Grand Valley region. These bone hunters aren't just your average day trippers. They love dinosaurs so much that they've signed for a five-day program that will let them actually dig for bones with trained scientists. This tour along the trail through time is part of their training for the dig site. Once participants in the program have gone through a day of these hikes, lectures, and orientation, they're ready for the main event. Well, this is the Mygat Moor Quarry out here in western Colorado in Rabbit Valley. This site was discovered in 1981 by Pete Mygat, who's still working the quarry very diligently and is one of the great promoters of this site. What have you found here in this quarry? Well, we've gotten eight different kinds of dinosaurs. We've got four of the long neck types of dinosaurs. We have several meat-eating dinosaurs. Most common is Allosaurus, but we also have Ceratosaurus and perhaps Marshosaurus. Much of the digging here is actually done by the tourists who sign up for these programs, and the results have yielded some serious paleontology. Recently, program participants discovered a small armored dinosaur called Mimora pelta. One of the first things you learn to do, of course, is how to excavate a dinosaur. And it's certainly not digging potatoes. We go a lot more slowly and more precisely using things like dental tools and simple, easy to get tools like screwdrivers. But we teach folks it's not like digging potatoes. We want to work in real clean areas because the bones are subtle. As you can see, they're tough to tell from the rock. So we want to have a real clean work area. But we also want to get across to people the science of dinosaur paleontology. You know, how do we do the detective work? How do we go in taking a piece of rib and use it to interpret the biology of the animal? But we also are trying to get across to the public uh, the excitement of the science, how we go about interpreting the way of life of these animals, you know, how we, are, we work as paleo detectives, how we use the data from the, the rocks we have here, the mudstones, this dinosaur dung adobe that we're digging in, to try to interpret what these animals were eating. How we look at a leg bone, such as this Allosaurus over here, to interpret what was perhaps its running speed, how fast could it run, how high could it jump. Uh, was this animal a carnivore or was it a scavenger? Was this thing killing its prey? Certainly, I believe it was killing its prey. In addition to doing most of the work, participants in the program also contribute to financial support of a lot of the paleontology being done in the Grand Junction area through their program fees, which can range up to $1,000. There are programs for adults, programs for children, and every day there's a discovery. Like today, they discovered this intact Allosaurus claw. The Dynamation Society excavations include lodging, but if you come to attractions like the Devil's Canyon Science Center, you may want to stay at the historic Hotel Melrose. Built in 1908 by a local farmer who immigrated from London, the Melrose also runs local adventure tours, including a tasting at local wineries and an excursion to the spectacular Colorado National Monument. The wondrous natural beauty of the monument area is a must-see and it's the perfect way to end your day here. The serene and the surreal jostle for your attention here. 350 million years of erosion have carved these stunning natural sculptures, vistas and formations. Enjoy these views and remember that they were ancient even when the first dinosaurs roamed these hills. The next town on our time tour through southwestern Colorado is Durango, which we will use as a base of operations for our visit to historic Silverton and our next stop, prehistoric Mesa Verde. Just for a moment, imagine yourself as a cowboy on horseback. The year is 1888, and you're riding over these mountains and mesas through a snowstorm looking for stray cattle, when suddenly, and quite by accident, you stumble upon this. That's the true story of one of the most amazing archaeological discoveries in American history. When ranch hands Richard Wetherill and Charles Mason discovered the ruins of an elaborate stone village built into these sheer cliffs, it had been sitting here quietly abandoned for 600 years. Today, Mesa Verde National Park includes hundreds of these cliff dwellings and is visited by more than 800,000 people a year from all over the world. 
Several of these pueblos are open to the public, including this one, which its discoverers named the Cliff Palace. Because the original inhabitants had no written language, many things about their lives here will probably never be known. But historian Dwayne Smith says that over the last hundred years, scientists have figured out a lot about them. Well, we, Bill, we don't know what they call themselves. Uh, we use a Navajo term, Anasazi, meaning the ancient ones. And they lived all over this Four Corners area. And people can see Chaco Canyon, and they can go to Aztec, New Mexico, and other places to see uh, where the Anasazi lived. They lived, they came about 200 AD, or BC, excuse me, they came up this canyon, and they were here until 1300 AD. And this was the height of their culture. This is the largest settlement they had, Cliff Palace. And they were here, reached the zenith of the culture, and then about 1270 to 1300, they just started to wander off. The Anasazi worked to live their lives in harmony with nature. Their choice to build these cliff dwellings where they did with a southern exposure shows careful attention to the cycle of the seasons. In summer, with the sun directly overhead, sunlight strikes only the front walls, leaving the back rooms cool and comfortable. In winter, the sun is much lower in the sky. Heat is passed more evenly to the rear rooms and into the cliff faces themselves. There are other ideas about why the Anasazi built these extraordinary cliff dwellings. For a first-hand look at one theory, be prepared to climb these long, steep ladders to another pueblo called Balcony House. Well, as you can see, there's only one way up here. And for the Anasazi, they didn't have this beautiful ladder and these nice trails. They had hand and toe holes in these rocks. Now, one of the great mysteries of this park, and there are many mysteries, that's what makes this park so fascinating to me and, and to all visitors, is why would they come up here? Why would they leave these mesa tops where they had water and land and open space for their towns to come in here? Was there some kind of an enemy? Because obviously if you got here, the enemy's not going to be able to get in very easily. Was there a civil war? Well, we don't know that either. But we can all take guesses in, of this mystery, and we can look and imagine what it was like to live here. Maybe they just wanted a good view. They have a magnificent view when you could put New York City and a lot of buildings down there and For still sure. see. One final reason they might have come here, Bill. These were farming people raising their corn and their squash, and the best land is out there. And so live here and use the best land out there where the water is. The Anasazi people grew and prospered in Mesa Verde for seven centuries. Their religious dedication to maintaining a balanced relationship with nature can be found at another spectacularly located building called Sun Temple. Well, Bill, this is Sun Temple, and it is the mystery of the mysteries that we've been talking about. Sun Temple was built here, and we don't know why. It was never finished. And there are no settlements right around here. So this was a ceremonial center, religious ceremony center, which served the people in the pueblos along both these canyons. Well, about the year 1270, they started to have a drought here. Now, all of a sudden, we go into a 30-year drought. But in the years from 1270 to about 1300, we start to move away. And for some reason, the Pueblo people never finished this. Recently, scientists have discovered one more piece of chilling evidence. Whatever drove the Anasazi from the Four Corners area, the situation must have been desperate. Well, this is certainly a popular spot with some wonderful examples of cliff-dwelling life. It certainly is, Bill. And if you look right here, a kiva, a classic kiva, you'll find these in all of these spruce tree house cliff palace and also on top of the mesas. These were the ceremonial chambers, mostly for the men, and they would do their dances, ceremonies in here, occasionally coming out in a plaza. But an interesting thing about these is, not here at Mesa Verde, but in some of the kivas outside of Mesa Verde, we found some ritual murders, where they murdered young men and women and children and chopped them up. Why would they do something like that? I know it's gruesome to us, but perhaps they felt that by breaking the bones, they were letting out the evil. And again, go back to that mystery of the, the why did they leave with the, with the weather and the climate and the tensions and the pressures on them. Perhaps in some areas they turned to this. Local tribes dispute the ritual murder theory, and without a written tradition, we'll probably never know what exactly did drive the ancient ones from this area of the Rocky Mountains. But when you visit here, it's hard not to miss the beauty and the majesty of the stone and clay they left behind speaking for themselves. From Mesa Verde, we return to Durango, where we'll catch an antique steam locomotive to the charming old silver town of Silverton.
Durango itself is a pretty little frontier mining town that has adapted itself to the modern tourist trade. Nestled in the shadows of the San Juan Range of the Rockies, the town is surrounded by spectacular forest and high desert scenery that makes it a gateway to all kinds of recreation opportunities, including hiking, skiing, and rafting. Downtown Durango features beautifully kept Victorian buildings that date to the town's founding in the 1880s. The real landmark among these is the red brick Strader Hotel at 7th and Main Streets. If you've ever wanted to sleep in a museum, the Strader Hotel is about as close as you can get. The place is filled with authentic displays and memorabilia and the rooms include the largest collection of American Victorian era walnut antiques in the world. If you do decide to stay here, you might want to try to get room 222. Western writer Louis L'Amour was famous for soaking up period details about the locations he wrote about. He would frequently come to this room, and he finished several of his novels sitting right at this table. In addition to lodgings, the Strader has an old-fashioned honky-tonk saloon complete with ragtime piano player. But for any history or railroad buff, there's no bigger thrill on a visit to southwestern Colorado than a chance to ride the narrow gauge railway to Silverton. The town of Durango was literally created by the railroad. In 1881, the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad Company announced plans for a new rail line to carry precious ore from Silverton. Now, originally, they wanted to run the tracks through the town of Anima City, two miles to the north. But the city fathers there wouldn't agree to the railroad company's terms. So the railroad built a town, called it Durango, and ran the tracks right through there. The three and a half hour trip to Silverton is a thrilling ride through steep mountain gorges and dramatic scenery. The locomotives are 100% coal-fired steam engines built in the mid-1920s, and many of the passenger cars actually date from the 1880s. It's called a narrow-gauge railroad because the tracks are spaced only three feet apart instead of the usual four feet, eight and a half inches to negotiate the rugged mountain terrain. The climb into Silverton is steep. The rails follow the Animus River up 2,800 feet of elevation on less than 50 miles of track. At the end of the line, you'll find a different kind of mining town from Durango. Silverton is surrounded by scenic snow-capped peaks. The 9,300-foot elevation means it's cooler in Silverton, so dress accordingly, and the thin mountain air makes altitude headaches a distinct possibility, so you might want to pack aspirin. Silverton is also older and rougher than Durango, with gravel streets and quite a few ramshackle clapboard buildings that look as though they might date from the gold and silver booms that built the town. In fact, some of them do. Unlike many old western towns, Silverton has never suffered a major fire, so many of the buildings in town went up before the turn of the century. The town may look like the authentic Old West, but of course it still offers a comfortable travel experience. There were several fine restaurants and hotels in town, including the Wyman Inn, which was built in 1902 as Silverton's social hall. The prospectors who founded the town came here looking for gold. Well, they didn't find much of that, but as they like to say here, they found silver by the ton. Unfortunately, the last mining operation closed down in 1991. But the narrow gauge railroad and all the visitors it brings helps the town to hang on even after the minerals that helped create it gave out. After about four days touring the Four Corners and Fossil Beds, you can go east for more historic Rockies. From Grand Junction, take Route 70 to see where all that Silverton silver ended up, the Denver Mint. From there, head south on Route 25 to historic Pikes Peak and the U.S. Air Force Academy at Colorado Springs. Or stay in western Colorado. An hour north of Silverton is that famed frontier mining camp turned ski resort tell you ride. It's a year-round stop. The entire community is designated a National Historic District. 
One of the great things about traveling in the Rockies is having the opportunity to traverse not just hundreds or thousands, but literally millions of years of history. Seeing dinosaurs, ancient pueblos, and frontier settlements all in the space of a couple days has a way of reminding us just how vast the canvas of Earth's past really is. I'm Bill Boggs. Thanks for joining us on Historic Traveler.